Today, we're going to talk about the sharing of personal information within Opus Dei. The average person who attends Opus Dei activities might be surprised by the amount of personal information that is shared within Opus Dei. I joined Opus Dei as a numerary member in April of 1998. And I remember very distinctly the first time I attended a get together uh, of numeraries uh, in that April. So a get together is after dinner in the center of Opus Dei, the numeraries that live there will kind of get together and hang out, talk for I think half an hour or 45 minutes. It's, it's supposed to be a family conversation. And the first time I attended one, I was quite surprised by the way that other people were talked about, the way their information was shared. Um, I don't exactly remember the details now, but I remember being kind of surprised and upset also. But in time, I got used to it. It's just part of the culture. Now, what do I mean by sharing of personal information? I want to be very clear. Uh, I'm not talking about like people sharing your deepest, darkest secrets. There's no negative information passed around. There's no gossip. There's no lack of charity, nothing like that. It's all positive. It's just surprising. So for example, uh, someone will ask a question like, oh, hey, Dave, you had coffee with Jim today. How'd that go? And then the conversation will be like, oh, it went well. He's doing well. His you know, school's going well for him. Uh, you know, he's praying more, he's uh, trying to get to mass more, he's thinking about going on the retreat, uh, you know, this coming, you know, next month, so pray for that, and other things like that. Again, nothing negative. Um, it's just part of the culture, and it's, it's unusual if you're outside of Opus Dei. So if you're attending an Opus Dei center, and you're, you go there for an event, realize that in, in a certain way, everyone knows everything. Again, not, your, not nothing negative about you, but they know that um, you're thinking about going to the retreat. They know that you're doing this, you're doing that. Um, and it's just, it's a little unusual. And the, the information sharing can, because it's part of the culture, I think people can occasionally cross boundaries and share more than they should. Uh, one example, when I was uh, living in Riverside, which is a center, men's center of Opus Dei on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and get together, uh, someone asked like, hey, Mike, you had, uh, you had coffee with uh, you know, Steve today, how'd that go? Oh, it's going well, he's doing pretty well. He's, yeah, things are going really well with his girlfriend. Like he's ring shopping now, so that's pretty serious. And I, I kind of had my jaw on the floor. I was like, dude, you can't, you can't, you can't share that. Like that's, uh, if a friend shares with a friend, like, Hey, I'm thinking about getting engaged. You can't just like broadcast that. That's insane. Um, I actually did give the guy a correction on that because it's just so egregious, but again, and stuff like that doesn't happen all the time at all. Um, but realize that sharing of personal information, not bad information. Um, it's just part of the culture and it's, it's unusual. And I think you'd be surprised. Now, when it comes to the sharing of personal information of numerary members of Opus Dei, it's a whole different thing. It's just, it's whole, it's next level stuff. So uh, my understanding is that this doesn't happen anymore, but it used to be that the local councils, the local government of a center of Opus Dei would type up kind of reports of conscience uh, as to how each particular uh, member of the center was doing. So literally report on the state of this person's soul. He's doing this, he's doing this well, he's struggling in that, he struggles with this. And it would get passed around uh, and then sent, sent up, and passed around within the local government, just the three, three or four people on the local council and then, and then passed up um, to the next level of government. And I, I had a weird experience. I, I didn't know they existed. And uh, I spent a summer working at a certain center in Chicago uh, I didn't live there. I was just visiting for the summer. And then the next, the next year I actually moved to that same center and I was doing some filing because I had to, they had like a backlog of things that needed to be filed, uh, within the local council room. And, uh, so I was working on filing that and that was part of my job. It was appropriate that I was there. 
and I came across a report of conscience on myself. And I was just like, what the, like, I had no idea these things even existed. And it was, it's very strange. In Opus Libros, which is a, it's a website that kind of mainly former numerators talk about their experiences in Opus Dei. I mean, one guy just gives an example of like this report of conscience gets written on a particular, particular numerary. It gets sent around the local council. So three or four other people are reading what's going on with Juan's soul. Uh, that would get passed up to the next level of government, the delegation. And so maybe like five or 10 guys are also reviewing the state of Juan's soul. That gets passed up to the next level of, you know, the regional government and they're looking at it. And it's just, it's just pretty wild actually. So my understanding is that these reports of conscience no longer happen. I haven't been in the work for a while, so I don't, I don't know that that's true or not. I assume it is. My understanding is that in the early, like 2010, 2011 ish, the Vatican kind of slapped the works wrist said, Hey, you guys need to separate spiritual direction from the task of government. Those two things cannot be combined. That's not appropriate. And then in 2011, uh, Javier Echeverria, who was the prelate of Opus Dei at the time, sent out a pastoral letter to the uh, centers of Opus Dei. Based, I think it was kind of a Vatican-facing letter saying, we don't do that. We've never done that. That's not in accordance with our spirit. And um, I, again, I wasn't in the work at the time, but from what I read, people were a little bit... They didn't know what to do with it because the unity of government and spiritual direction, it's almost, it's one of the defining features of Opus Dei. So I don't, I don't know what he, I, I just, it's a very odd thing because it's hard to see how that would be true. Um, in any event, my understanding is that these reports of conscience no longer exist. Um, but I have read criticism that the same information is sort of conveyed, uh, maybe not in written form, um, but you know, through conversations, through intimations, through um, there's just ways of communicating information with an Opus Day that are hard to uh, describe, um, but they're also very real. I've also heard some people advocating that it's not appropriate for the priest of Opus Dei to be a part of the local council for, you know, which is the local government of the center, because uh, it would be really hard for him not to um, accidentally convey more information than he should, right? And so some people have said they've observed priests sort of, again, information can be conveyed very subtly. You know, it's uh, information is conveyed in a pause, in a facial gesture, in a cough. And uh, again, I never witnessed this myself when I was in Opus Dei. Um, I didn't observe it, at least I wasn't aware of it. I will say that when I was given a talk on, I think it was on local government in Opus Dei, the person giving me the talk said something like, always pay very close attention when the priest gives his opinion on something because he really can't say that much, but you really gotta pay attention to, like for example, uh, if you're discussing, um, you know, should we ask this or that person if they wanna join Opus Dei? And the priest says, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd wait. Like, really you have to give a ton of weight to his opinion because he knows more than he can say which again it's not uh necessarily violating any thing but it's it's you kind of get into a dicey area there again i didn't observe this so an example that i did experience that might um clarify a little bit or more make more concrete what i'm talking about in the early 2000s, I was helping out at a, a summer course for numeraries, which is like, I think three weeks or four weeks where guys are together studying philosophy. And I was on the local council for that, um, for that semester. And at the very beginning, the local council was getting briefed by uh, a senior member of the Opus Dei's government in the United States. So someone was out from New York, 
we were going through some points that the regional directors of the work wanted us to know. So the directors of the work in the United States wanted us to know. And uh, I remember the guy saying regarding a certain guy in the course, like, oh yeah, well, just so you know, he's having trouble with point in the catechism of the Catholic church, you know, I don't know, 573 or something. I don't remember what the number was. And I, I was a little confused. I'm like, I'm sorry. What, like what, what is point 573? And, um, he's like, oh, it's, it's about masturbation. Okay. Uh, that's something I didn't necessarily want to know about or need to know about. Um, but the point is just like, there was absolutely no need for that information to be conveyed. Obviously very personal, uh, and just, I mean, I don't know how we as a local council were supposed to collectively prevent this guy from masturbating. It was just very strange, but like, but again, it's that like that con conveyance of personal information, uh, including, you know, moral struggles. That's just, uh, it's a sort of thing that happens in Opus Dei. So those are some things that I've experienced that I've witnessed. I mean, I've been out of the work for a while. I don't know exactly what happens now. I mean, of course, Jose Maria Escriva has like very pretty things to say about reports of conscience and other things like, oh, it should be something your mother would be able to read and et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, a lot of very personal information is conveyed within the work about individuals, especially numeraries. And uh, that's all. I just thought it'd be something people should know about. Thanks. Mm -hmm.